Yeah. Okay, so I get to kick off. Um, we really anticipated all different levels of expertise around the table, so I was asked to start with a few background items about normal cellular development, function, and operation, to sort of lay the groundwork for some of the treatment modalities that we'll talk about later. So, to begin with, you know, if you look at the cross-section of a cell, and this is any living cell, um, you can see that it's really a busy place, and it's like a small city in itself, and there's a lot that goes on. And each one of these different organelles and, and, and items within there have their own responsibility to do, and they rely on each other to work optimally, and that allows us to live optimally. So there's a lot of processes and communication that goes on, too, to be able to have this, this balance that we, we really take for granted at times. Some of the functions that go on, you know, this is, this is pretty basic stuff. The membranes protect us from the outside world. The, the DNA kind of transmits the code. Um, the mitochondrial power plants and so on and so forth. But they, and they're all very knowledgeable and aware of what they need to do within their little environment. It almost reminds me of uh, that Dr. Seuss, um, the, doctor, the, the Who character, what was that, Horace or whatever his name was, and how there was this microcosm city within this piece of dust. And it's really very similar to that. Um, and then, of course, there are different cell types, and these cell types all have different jobs. And they kind of hang together with other similar cell types to form tissues, which all also have their particular jobs. One of the things that's important to kind of keep track of when you're talking about oncology treatments is the cell cycle. It's an important part of chemotherapy because some of the drugs will act on certain phases during the cell cycle. Those are cell cycle specific drugs and Anna Marie will talk a little bit more about those. But other drugs are not and they, they're not specific so it doesn't really matter. But for, for a majority of drugs that are chemotherapy, they do relate on the cell cycle. So let's see how this works. Um, this is just like a four or five minute video about the cell cycle.
So looking at the cells that we, we all know the, the stem cells, these are the undifferentiated master cells that have the potential to turn into whatever the body needs. And it's all about keeping, keeping the system in balance. So um, there's a very complicated feedback system that has to be almost worked perfectly in order to get these signals sent from all over the body. It's a system-wide process. If we just focus on the hematopoietic stem cells in the system, because that's really what we're most interested in when we're talking about cancer therapies. Um, but if we just focus on those, you can see that on the left side of the screen that it all starts with the stem cell. And these stem cells have the ability to self-renew, and they will um, divide and, and turn, into, turn out these cells that are whatever the body will need. For the most part, with the exception of the lymphocytes at the top of the screen, for the most part, the first couple of stages are the same as it goes through the process. But by that time, by the time it gets to, to these stages, it has to decide what these cells are going to turn into. So let's say, for example, that you have um, a GI bleed going on and you're bleeding, bleeding, losing all these erythrocytes. Well, changes in the cell volume will kind of indicate to the stem cells, we need more erythrocytes. How that all happens is, is above my pay grade. I couldn't begin to explain how it all happens and how it knows which types of cells, but it does. And so it will tell a group of cells, you're gonna mature into erythrocytes, and then maybe an infection is also going on, it tells another group of cells, you're gonna mature, mature into neutrophils, and it keeps everything in balance and everything protected. Now, it's important to know that if once, once a cell is kind of slated in a certain direction, it can't be changed. It's committed to that type of cell, and it won't be changed into something later on. So there's also a, cert a certain amount of certainty that the stem cells have to have as far as what we need and what priority. So I'd love to be able to take you through leukocytes and all of that, but there's not time to do that. So uh, just as sort of a quick review, there are granulocytes, agranulocytes, and of each of these different types of white blood cells, they all have a certain role that they have to fulfill for the body. Um, some respond to allergic reactions, some to pathogens, and so on and so forth. The erythrocytes, they constitute about oh, just about half of the, of the volume of the blood system. These erythrocytes are concave in the middle. That allows them to become very flexible as they're maneuvering through the really tiny um, microcosm of the vasculature. And they are produced in the bone marrow and then spit out into the circulation when they're mature enough. They have a lifespan of about 120 days. And that's important to remember because when you're giving people chemotherapy that's, that's causing anemia, they always have that sort of a lag. It never really, they never really notice the anemia right away. It takes a couple, three months because the circulating erythrocytes are still there, they're still doing their job. Unfortunately, when those die off, there's not new ones in the bone marrow to be kind of sent out to replace them. And that's why you get that lag. The thrombocytes are, are um, important for um, first responders to any kind of vascular assault. So if you have a cut or an open wound, it's the thrombocytes that go in first, while the fibrin formations are occurring on a more uh, a longer delay. And they're, they're really fragments of cells, and they're very, it makes them very tiny. And that's important because then when they get into those really tight spaces and they're having to seal up that hole, they can kind of lay over each other and squeeze in and do what they need to do. The normals, the low normal is, is estimated at about 150,000. What's the lowest anyone here has seen somebody walk around in fairly good shape? Two. That was mine too, yeah. So there's kind of a, it's kind of misleading. I mean, we like to see them with having really healthy counts, but if they get to 50 or 45, they might be just fine. But we still want to take precautions. We still want to make sure that they're protected from any kind of injury as best as we can. But that's why you might not see transfusions being ordered until they're actually bleeding. Because they can go quite a ways until they start to have problems. So we kind of alluded to the fact that within the cell there's, there's this real, real important need for them to be able to communicate well. And I think science is just starting to kind of scratch the surface on how we understand those communications to take place. But this is going to be really important for the future of cancer therapies because as we understand more about the normal processes, we're going to be able to understand how we can intervene, how the, how the cancer cells are interrupting those normal processes.
looked at in science right now. Um, apoptosis, dendritic pruning, and the telomeres are probably the most popular. So with our limited time frame here, I'm just going to real, real briefly look at what those are. So apoptosis is, is referred to as programmed cell death, or sometimes as cellular suicide. And this is a process that the body has to weed out the, the old and the damaged cells. So through this process of communication, it can tell if a cell has been around too long, if it's circulated too many times, or if it's been damaged in some way, and it's no longer able to function properly. In that case, it starts this whole process of apoptosis, where it breaks the cell down, it determines which con contents can be recycled and used again, and which are just depleted and need to be eliminated from the body. So um, the last time we talked with class, um, we talked about how frequently this happens within your body on a routine basis, and I asked the question, if you have a really bulky lymphoma, and you're introducing chemotherapy for the first time, and eliminating a large portion of that, that bulky tumor, what, what's that risk of happening? What are you most concerned about? Can you, can you think of anything? What kind of an oncologic emergency is the most problematic? Tumor lysis syndrome? Because what happens is you're destroying so many cells all at once, and those cells are, are, are rupturing and spilling their contents out into the circulation. And so you've got electrolytes, uric acid, and all sorts of things that are naturally residing in the cell that are getting just flooded into the system all at once, and it's toxic. And so we use things to try to prevent that. Hydration, you know, I, my mind just went blank. I can't think of the drug. Alipurinol. Alipurinol. Um, but we, we try to, to prevent that from happening, but imagine that during apoptosis, normally within the body and within the cells, they're turning over these cells all the time. And some of these cells are, are being ruptured and also spilling their contents out. But there has to be a really delicate balance within the body so that um, it doesn't create its own tumor lysis syndrome just from the normal chain of events. So those are the types of things that science are looking to understand so that we can mimic them better in therapeutic situations. Dendritic pruning is something that happens to try to um, remain and keep the signals and the synapse intact. Um, we know that the axons have to be able to communicate with the dendrites on the neuron cells, and sometimes those dendrites get a little bit long and wispy, and they interfere and they're not lined up just right with synapse. So the body has the ability to trim those back so that it's, it's more closely aligned and you can see in this one, it's kind of laying over the cell, so it's kind of blocking its own signal. So if it turns it back appropriately, then that signal becomes reinstituted and, um, and things function a lot better. So these are some of the things that are, are being looked at. Telomeres have been in the news for a while, and we know that um, science so far has told us that as, telomere, as we age, telomeres shorten. Now Mary, yeah, did I, did you get that and I haven't had a chance to look at it, but she found a report that, said that correlated long telomeres with breast cancer. So the length of the telomeres seem to make a difference, um, regardless of which way it is. But I do know that, it, it, that Shamas did a study where they were looking at the likelihood that short telomeres were leading to malignancies, and there was a correlation. And so they were looking to see what are the, some of the things that affect the telomeres and shorten the telomeres. And, and obesity, smoking, and stress were some of the, the top items. So there's going to be a lot of research looking at that to see if we can protect the telomeres and, and prevent malignancies down the road. This is just a quick slide. I'm not going to go through it, but I wanted you to have it because I always think it's interesting to look at the different lifespans of the different cells. And it, it explains a lot sometimes where some of our symptoms are coming from and, and the timing of them. Um, and just briefly, I'm going to just do a quick little reminder about your, your natural immunity because when Anne is talking, or Mary is talking about biotherapies later, um, this is kind of the foundation for all of that. We're all born with immunity, it's our innate immunity, and it includes the things that we're just born with. Um, so it includes things like our dendritic cells and our natural killer cells and our T cells. These are all active in our bodies and protect us from foreign invaders. I'm going to go back. And then a 
acquired immunity really kind of breaks down into two, two categories. We have the active acquired immunity, which are our own antibodies that, that form when we're exposed to antigens. Um, and then passive, which is what we get when we are exposed to vaccines and, and things like that. So these are all sort of natural processes that are very important with biotherapies because biotherapies by and large try to kind of make superheroes out of our immune system so that they can work much more effectively. So the differences between the two types of immunity then is the innate is already there, so it's ready to go, it's in action, so it can happen very fast. Unfortunately, it's not very specific. Whereas the acquired that we build from our own exposures are more specific to the things that we're exposed to, but they take some time before they build up and are, are able to function. So that's gonna have to be an obstacle. It's something that science is gonna be looking at to see how we can get these things into our system faster. So that's it as far as this first review. Um, and while they're getting switched over, are there any kind of questions or anything you wanna add? This is one of those things, you know, you're a nerd if you're really interested in telomeres. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was kind of weird because we kind of were laughing about that, you know. And then I get these emails from, I don't know, even what is a journal or something. And the, the front page of it was telomeres, what was it, long, long telomeres with breast, breast cancer. cancer. Yeah. yeah, and then they looked at lung cancer. And I lung cancer too there was not and but then you said smoking and the pressure yeah, yeah. So, so anyway it was interesting these are these are the types of things we shoot emails back and forth about you know not like how are your kids or <laughs> how's your telomeres? how's your weekend how's your telomeres, your telomeres. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad it is sad it is sad, it is sad. <laughs> All right, this is not a, this first slide is not a reflection on Pam. It says, I know you're as excited as I am about today's lesson. I thought that was poorly placed. <laughs>
your best shot. First line chemotherapy is your best shot. It's your gold, gold standard. Uh, if it doesn't work, chances are pretty good that you're gonna have to go to a second line, third line, fourth line, until finally you would reach palliative. If first line chemotherapy doesn't work, your chances of second line uh, working is, is really probably almost zero. Um, but we're, <clears throat> we're at least offering them longevity. You know, hopefully we can make them live longer and, and live better. <clears throat> palliative chemotherapy is uh, gonna address a symptom. So let's say you have a large tumor that's sitting on a nerve, then you might give some uh, radiation to shrink it back, you might give some chemotherapy to shrink it back. Have you made a great impact on this cancer? You know, like Dr. Body used to say, if I have something the size of a basketball and now it's the size of an orange, it's still the size of an orange. And that's kind of what this palliative chemotherapy is. It's still a large tumor that's present, but if we removed it off of a, a nerve and we've relieved their symptoms, then it was worthwhile. So how does chemo work? Um, as Pam described, cells have a normal cycle. They live, they grow, and they die, and they're predictable. When cancer occurs in the body, it is not predictable. So cancer, the normal cells are those good, good kids that you have in your household. You know, they do everything that they're told to do, and they do it, uh, they listen to mom. Cancer cells are the bad kids in your family, and they don't listen to anybody. And so they have their own agenda. Um, they grow irrespective of, um, they, they don't get the signal to, to knock it off and stop. So they just continue to grow. Chemotherapy is most effective at killing cells that are rapidly dividing. And so we know that, unfortunately, most chemo is not a smart mom. It's not a pistol, it's more like a, a, a shotgun. And so when it uh, affects rapidly dividing cells, yes, cancer is a rapidly dividing cell, but unfortunately there's other parts of the body that are rapidly dividing as well. And that's where you get your side effects. So you're looking at hair follicles, we obviously have to cut our hair so it's growing rapidly. You're looking at the lining of the GI tract and you're looking at the bone marrow. So those, when you're thinking about side effects of chemotherapy, those are kind of things that are known to you. You know that a lot of patients will have hair loss, <clears throat> a lot of patients will get mouth sores, the lining of the GI tract starts at the mouth, goes to the anus. So you're looking at mouth sores, uh, GI distress, nausea, vomiting, maybe diarrhea, and then you're looking at bone marrow suppression. And this doctor has explained to this patient, the red circles are your red blood cells, the white circles are your white blood cells. The brown circles are donuts. We need to talk. So bone marrow suppression, down. So your counts are going to drop. You're going to lose your hair. You might be nauseated. You might get mouth sores. You might get diarrhea. And your blood counts are probably going to drop. When we talk about chemo protocols, this, uh, this cartoon says, nurse with this chemo cocktail, get me some mixed nuts and pretzels. And I know some of us probably feel like waitresses uh, in the infusion room, but um, remember what you're doing is, is a good service to the patient. But when we talk about protocols, it's usually a combination of drugs, and we try to put drugs together that have um, dissimilar side effects so that we're not uh, hitting the patient too hard, but we're hitting the cancer hard enough. We have a lot of work to do with protocols. New drugs are coming out all the time. New combinations of, of ways to use the drugs are coming out all the time. But there's a lot more work to do. <laughs> Move aside, pal. One word for me, and this guy turns you into a whoopee cushion. So the sumo wrestler is the cancer cell, and the little guy that's getting squished is the normal cell. So contact inhibition is the cancer cell does not care that it has bumped into something. A normal cell will stop growing. It'll say, it'll grow, and it'll split again, it'll split again. Oh, I'm bumping it into another cell. I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna take a rest. Well, a cancer cell doesn't care about contact inhibition, so it's a bully, and it just keeps growing 
and growing and pushing the other guys out of the way and gets larger and larger and larger. <coughs> So the only way that chemo is going to work is it has to kill it has to kill those cancer cells, and it, and the way it's going to do that it's going to work someplace in that cell cycle, someplace in that cell division. They usually work by damaging RNA or DNA, and that's what tells the cell to copy itself to divide. If the cells are unable to divide, they die. The faster the cancer cells divide, the more likely it is that chemo will kill the cells. So, as I said before, rapidly dividing cells are more likely to be to be um, killed. Cancer is a rapidly dividing cell. Now, sometimes we have uh, a cancer that that you know a lymphoma, a, a, an indolent lymphoma. It doesn't grow very rapidly. Chemotherapy isn't as effective with an indolent lymphoma because it's not dividing fast enough. Now, I'm not saying we don't treat indolent lymphomas because we do, but you're not gonna get the same um, bang out of that chemotherapy as you would with a aggressive lymphoma. And an aggressive lymphoma, you're gonna see tumor lysis syndrome because that, that cancer is gonna break down right away. So there are chemotherapy drugs that are cell cycle specific and chemotherapy drugs that are cell cycle non-specific. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, this is, uh, this is a little video by um, Cancer Center Treatments of America. And I'm not a proponent. I'm not for them or against them. I have really no opinion of them. But it's a really good video. So. And I hope you're going to be able to hear it. That will be the next, next uh, struggle. One out of every two men and one out of every three women will be diagnosed with cancer. But despite those huge numbers, most individuals don't know what that really means. At the simplest level, cancer or cancer cells are cells that have lost the ability to follow the normal control that the body exerts on all cells. In our body, we have billions and billions of cells, and they have different functions. It's a very complicated process under incredibly phenomenal control. And if something goes wrong and that control is lost, and particular cells escape the normal control mechanisms, and they continue to grow, and they may spread, that's what we call cancer. Those cells together, we would call that a tumor. Specifically, cancer is a malignant tumor, and we call it malignant because not only can it invade into adjacent organs, but unfortunately, a cancer can spread to other tissues, and that can be life-threatening. Cancer can actually occur anywhere in the body because there are cells everywhere in the body. In women, one of the most common cancers, of course, is breast cancer, and in men, prostate cancer. And in both men and women, lung cancer and colon cancer are common cancers. It's important to understand that the cancer that occurs in one individual is very different than the cancer that occurs in another, just like those individuals are different. So a lung tumor in one person will be very different from a lung tumor in another person. Once the diagnosis of cancer is made, of course, the next obvious question is what do you do? There are several things that are really relevant. The stage of the cancer, which is information about where is the cancer? Do you say it's a particular kind of cancer? How much cancer is present? Has it spread? Is it in lymph nodes? Has it spread to other organs of the body? Cancer treatment actually is very complex. And part of the reason is because cancer is this constellation of over 200 different diseases. They have common characteristics, but they're all very different from each other. In addition to that, the cancer itself is not homogeneous. There may be three or four or five or six different slight variations in the cancer cells that are there. People ask, why? Why does my cancer not go away? It shrunk by 70%. What's wrong with the other 30%? Well, it's probably a different subtype of that cancer, which is going to require a different kind of treatment. There are three primary therapies for cancer, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Surgery works by directly removing the tumor. 
The radiation therapy provides x-rays to kill individual cells, and the chemotherapy provides chemicals that can kill those individual cells. But they have side effects. The best therapies that we can produce really are the result of optimizing the amount of tumor that we can kill by any treatment and minimizing the amount of damage that we cause to the normal cells that would be affected by that treatment. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we have a very robust integrative oncology program. Integrative oncology is taking those conventional oncology treatments and integrating those with therapies like acupuncture, naturopathic medicine, chiropractic, nutrition, to blend those together and to create the most appropriate treatment plan for that individual patient at that moment in time. Cancer Treatment Centers of America has invested in a model in which all of the effects of cancer and its therapy are aggressively treated and managed. It's not just enough to kill the cancer if we don't treat the pain, the fatigue, the depression, or the anxiety that comes with a diagnosis of cancer. Receiving a diagnosis of cancer can be a frightening thing. The good news is that today is probably the most exciting time in history in terms of the treatment of cancer. Options that didn't exist a few months ago certainly didn't exist a few years ago, like the ability to genomically profile a tumor and to take that individualized fingerprint of that cancer may direct us to tailor treatment in very specific ways. We believe that in the future, uh, many more patients with a number of different tumor types will potentially be able to benefit from the advances in precision medicine. There are very hopeful options that are available to us as clinicians to make a difference in patients' lives. And it's therefore just as important for patients to know that so that they have those hopeful options and they take advantage of them. they still 
lost their hair. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, that's why I like chemo because it, it's, it goes everywhere. The other two treatments are certainly necessary, and um, uh, but they're local treatments, and chemo is more of a systemic treatment. Except for most drugs do not cross the blood brain barrier. So now we're going to get into uh, the classifications. First of all, the first chemotherapy, you notice these poor gentlemen with gas masks on, was um, mustard gas was used during World War II, but they found out is that the sailors and the soldiers that came back, their lymph nodes were shrunk down to nothing and their blood counts were in, in the basement. They, all their blood counts went down. So somebody said, gee, I wonder why that happened. Maybe we ought to do something with it. So they tested it on mice, and the same thing happened to those poor little mice. So then they got a related drug called mustine, which was, which was the drug right before nitrogen mustard. And they gave it to patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they found out that their little lymph nodes shrunk and their blood counts took, it, took a dive also. So they developed um, this drug, nitrogen mustard, and that was the first chemotherapeutic agent. It came from something terrible. It came from World War I. But, um, we used it for a, a bazillion years um, until better drugs came along, basically. But at least, at least they had something to go on. It was the beginning. It was a good beginning because it worked. It worked well. Since then, I don't know. When we first started, I think we were lucky to see a drug a year. Don't you think? Oh. It was terrible. It would take six, seven years for a drug to come out. Now it happens so often. I feel like if I don't go to work for a couple of weeks, there's three new drugs that have, that have come out. I mean, it's never been like this. And, and it's not that they're fast tracking them, it's just research is better than it ever was. And a lot of money is being poured into it. So there are certain classifications of drugs. We're going to go over all of them. It's not the most exciting thing in the world to talk about, but, um, but we will get through it. And uh, Sometimes you can tell by the, the class of the drug what kind of side effects you're going to have associated with it. And so it might help you if, if you're having a busy day and you can't get to the internet to look something up. It might help you um, figure things out. So we're going to talk first about alkali alkylating agents. And they are active in the resting phase. So these are cell cycle non-specific. There's a lot of different ones on this. <coughs> this uh, list. Some of them we don't even use anymore. Some are just totally out of, uh, off the market. Uh, some we don't need anymore because better things have, have come our way. But let's take uh, just one of these. Well, actually, we're going to take two on this list. We're going to take carb, uh, cisplatin and oxaliplatin. So when you think of cisplatin, what, what's, the, what's one of the Give me some side effects that you might think you would see with cisplatin. Come on. Nausea. Nausea. Bad nausea. Vomiting. Bad nausea. Bad vomiting. Bad drug. Tough drug to tolerate. What else? Kidney. Who would say? Kidney problems. Kidney problems. Cystitis. Uh, anything else? Hearing problems sometimes. Yeah, it, it can affect the uh, it's odor toxicity. It can affect the uh, the hearing nerve. They get too much of it, and um, especially the testicular patients, they get really big doses of platinum, and uh, a lot of times they do have hearing loss. So that should be part of your assessment. Make sure um, they're not upping the volume on the TV, and they're um, not saying "huh" all the time. Uh, blood counts are going to drop going to be hair loss. Uh, you have to protect the kidneys, so you're going to have to give a lot of hydration uh, before and after. And for us, usually several days uh, after the drug, too, we have to come back in for, for uh, hydration. Um, Oxaliplatin, the part of full fox. What are some side effects of it? What's the most unique side effect of oxaliplatin? Somebody's getting full fox. Cold. Yeah, right. Yeah, so why, Honor? I don't know. Anyways, it must.
must ex it excites the nerve endings uh, anywhere in the body. It's it's like a neuropathy, but you know most of the time when we think of neuropathies, it's uh, numbness, <coughs> tingling, but not associated with touching something or being ex exposed to something. Well, with oxali, it is. It's being exposed to something cold. Usually lasts three to four days after their treatment. Um, we usually say in the clinic, um, put, a, put a pair of gloves over the handle of the fridge because your whole life you've reached into the refrigerator and, and the freezer and gotten what you want. So that'll at least alert you to be careful and glove up before you go in there. Um, lasts about three or four days. I tell patients the fourth day, open up the fridge, put your finger on something that's cold in there, the milk carton, thing of water, whatever. You can put your finger on it, then try to put your hand on it. If you can put your hand on it, you can probably drink it. If they don't pay attention to us, because some are cowboys, you know, and these guys, they think it's not going to affect me, um, they'll pay for it because it feels like, they tell me, it feels like razor blades. Uh, it, the lips just feel like they're being sliced. The, the back of the throat feels like it's being sliced. If they're in a car and you have the vent pointing at their cheek or their arm, it'll excite those nerve endings and it'll hurt just as if they, they touch something cold, just that burst of cold. We tell them, you know, wear hats, wear scarves, uh, wear, certainly wear gloves, and make your trip in and out of a building quickly. So we think of uh, mega alkaloids, that's from the periwinkle plant. Taxanes are from the yew tree, which is like a Christmas tree. Um, and then I'm sure everyone has one of these in their backyard, the May apple plant and the happy tree. Um, basically the premise of the plant alkaloids is they're, they're derived from plants. Now in the old days, Taxol had to be given Remember, they were in ICU, oh, yeah. and they were in ICU for days, and it was dripped over like 24 oh, hours, or 36 hours. It was ridiculous. every 15 minutes. That's right. <laughs> and then they found <laughs> out that you gave it so slow that you caused actually more toxicity no, than the less. <laughs> so, so that drug actually has sped up to now between one and three hours, depending on the dose. Um, so. We had one patient, she was actually our nursing instructor. Um, yeah, our nursing instructor. And um, she, she, was re she had ovarian and she was gonna receive Taxol. And so we gave it to her, just like we normally would. And she looked like a beet in about six drips of the, of the drug. Remember? And it's the worst Taxol reaction I've ever seen. She ended up going to the hospital, and obviously we never re-challenged her with that again. But she was allergic to uh, Christmas trees. So it's something to think about. It is synthetically made now, so I think it's um, less, less likely to occur, but you can certainly still have Taxol and Taxotere reactions. Uh, don't see them very often, but they can still occur. Then you have VP16 down there, or in a TCAN type of TCAN. Um, so let's take uh, let's take one of the taxanes, taxol, taxotere, and shout out some um, possible side effects that you might see with with the taxane. Aches, achy, achy. Doing neuropathy. Neuropathy. Nail beds. Yeah, the nail the nail bed uh, will separate. The nail will separate from the nail bed and. What's my line? This is not, this is not, um, uh, no, my disclaimer. Oh, oh. It's it's not, a, this, this is, is not, not evidence-based. Evidence -based That's right, this is not evidence-based medicine. But we will recommend that the patients buy tea tree oil and that they paint their fingernails with it about 45 times a day. And it stinks. They don't care for the smell of it. Sometimes, if you buy a more expensive product, it doesn't doesn't smell as badly. Um, but for some reason, that does seem to keep the nail stuck to the nail bed. Uh, but it is not evidence based. And then looking at um, VP16, that's actually a drug that's tolerated really well. But it has one unusual thing that you, as nurses, need to do before and after, which is because it can make your blood pressure go down. Arenatecan is a drug that um, causes a lot of diarrhea. And topotecan, 
by the time a patient gets to topo tecan, they already feel bad. And if you give them topo, topo tecan, they're going to feel worse. Uh, that's usually a fourth line drug, kind of a last ditch effort. Nobody likes topo tecan. Uh, usually patients don't stay on it for long, either because their, their tumor progresses or they just can't tolerate the side effects of it. Uh, anti-tumor anti antibiotics. These kind of sound like antibiotics. Uh, they're made from um, soil fun fungus, streptomyces. When you, when you think of these drugs, you, you look at how these end, and they just kind of sound like mycins, you know, they sound like antibiotics. So let's take um, the most famous up there. Let's take adriamycin and tell me some side effects that you see with adriamycin. Hair loss, hair loss, total hair loss. They will lose uh, the hair on the top of their head. They will lose their eyelashes, their, their eyebrows, their pubic hair. Men will lose their beards. Um, it's total hair loss. And I guess you don't realize how important your eyelashes are until you don't have them. And then patients will come in with um, red eyes. and um, they, they just look like they're uncomfortable all the time when they've lost their their eyelashes. Uh, what else can you see with Adrian? Nausea, uh -huh. What else? What color is the What color is the drug? It's red. Right. Will be kind of orangish, pinkish tinge. Uh, you have to warn them of that because they're going to think they're bleeding. Because you've already told them their platelets are going to go down. So you have to reassure them that's not that's not what's happening. The heart, um, uh, you have to do a MUGA or an ECHO before. Make sure they're fit for duty before you even try it. Uh, you might do another one in the middle of treatment, maybe more often, and then uh, certainly at the end of treatment. The the um, heart. The, the weakening of the heart muscle with atria is different than it is with Herceptin. Herceptin is uh, generally reversible. You wait, give them a little bit of a break, and the, the heart muscle will come back. With atria, uh, it's usually permanent. We had a young guy, and I just saw his name in the paper the other day. He's uh, unfortunately passed away. He had remember what he had, but he had high doses of adriamycin, and he was only about 30, I think, when we treated him. And we just kept treatment, because at that time, we didn't know that you could only give a certain amount according to their height and weight, and so this just accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. And he had a weakened heart at the end of the treatment, but it got progressively worse to the point where he, he finally had to have a heart transplant. And he lived many, many years. He's, gosh, he's, he was probably um, almost as old as I got with me by now. But, <laughs> which is, we, as Mary's pointed out, is older than dirt. And, um, but, he, but he did live a long time, but he, but he had to get a new heart because we really damaged his heart. So we have to watch those, uh, those muggas and muggas and make sure that injection fraction is uh, where it needs to be. I think any other uh, blood counts, of course, will really tank with atriamycin. Vesica. It's a vesica. It's a baby. That's it's a baby. A baby. So
Yeah, right, right Victoria, you better look best. best. I, I didn't see that, but I had her. Oh my gosh, I see her. Yeah. And home care, she told him it bothered him, and she, they told her it was fine. Uh huh. The needle's fine. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And, and it is worrisome because you have somebody hooked up to something, and they're I'm like, the they're sleeping. I, I can ima only imagine what he said. Oh yeah. And they're sleeping, and they're rolling, and they're turning, and they're tugging, and they're walking, and you know that needle can just work its way loose, or you can have a fracture. And if it, if the port actually fractures, it's it may you may still get a blood return, but it's just open enough that. It can leak out. my myeloma regimen that we, we, we dripped Adrian and Christy. That's right. It's <laughs> back. 1,000 cc back. Oh, boy. Oh, I that. And I was <laughs> so not, not one vesica. Oh, yeah. But both two. <laughs> yeah. And not Doxel. It was, it was Adrian. It was Adrian. Adrian and Christy. Yep. Mixed it in one, one bag. Obviously, that didn't help myeloma because we don't do that anymore. No. <laughs> That's right. Ooh. Yeah, the big pink bag. It was nasty. So a lot of side effects with Adriamycin. Um, uh, bleomycin has a unique side effect. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, really, uh, yeah pulmonary, pulmonary, pulmonary issues. So uh, they have to have PFTs before, PFTs during, PFTs after. Make sure you haven't harmed their lungs. 
tumor that you have tested in the lab. And in the old days, we just did ER, we found out what the heck it was, and then we did ERs and PRs, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. And that was good enough for us. Now we've added her two news to it. So now we have an, uh, another thing that helps us understand how the tumor will behave and what treatment we should give the patient. So when you think about tamoxifen uh, for somebody or, or the aromatase inhibitors on the bottom, the aromasin, aromadex, amara, um, kind, of, kind of think of it this way. You have a tumor that is estrogen and or progesterone po positive. So in order for that tumor to survive, it has to be fed. So when you want a nice green lawn, you call Barefoot and they put fertilizer on it and you have a beautiful, beautiful green lush lawn. Okay? Now if you have a breast cancer and it's ERPR positive, if you want that tumor to grow and grow and grow, you want to give it more estrogen. Okay? That would be the fertilizer for it. So we don't want to do that. We want to block uh, any estrogen from entering that, that breast cancer. So we're going to give an anti-estrogen. And examples of that are tamoxifen. In the old days, that's all we had. Um, it worked well. The thing is, we only gave it for a couple of years. We stopped. And now new science has come out that we need to give it more like five to 10 years. And, and the patients aren't happy about that. The patients that are most unhappy about it are the ones that thought they were only going to take it for two years, and then we had to break it to them. No, you have to stay on it. And one of the biggest side effects with tamoxifen is the, the price. The price. The price of the tamoxifen and all the aromatase inhibitors is cost. The next side effect that you think about with those drugs is power surges, the hot flashes. And that will cause a lot of patients from just stopping it. They won't take it anymore because they can't. They can't take it anymore. And um, they're miserable and they're moody and they're sweating all the time or they're cold all within the same minute. But we know that these drugs can alter a patient's course and you know cure them so that this, this uh, breast cancer never comes back. I'd say nowadays probably 95% of the patients complete their course. The problem with the aromatase inhibitors, the problem with the tamoxifen is some patients can 